My name is Kyle Cherick, and I am the host for this evening and for this series of the Madison College Chef Demo Series presented by Volga. To my right is my friend, Sorry. fairly cracking up about something, <laughs> uh, Michael Twitty. What the heck? So I'm just like, <laughs> I haven't seen him and then get up to the knees, so it's like, yeah. bring him back memory, but it's all good. Yeah, all right. Front row seat. Um, Michael Twitty is a culinary historian, culinary interpreter, food writer, and uh, unaffiliated scholar. How do you put it? Independent scholar. Independent scholar, that's right. His subject is the African diaspora. African America and uh, African cuisine in history. And we have known each other for a couple five years, I think. Yeah. We bonded over hummus. That's right. Black eyed yeah. hummus. Black eyed hummus. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Which is a terrific way to bond with anybody in particular, is a terrific way to bond with you. So, we're going to give you a little bit of your path and how you ended up here in this esteemed stage, Madison College. Uh, and where you are in your career, but for the rest of you that may not know all of Michael's bio, I'll do a very quick synopsis. In 2010, he started publishing uh, the single most, I think, African culinary blog in history, called Afro Culinaria. And I was an avid reader. I think I get credit probably in your third month. Um, but it was your thoughtful, intellectual, uh, compassionate, and uh, historically reasoned retort to Paula Deen's racism that really puts you on the national map, and that was in 2012, correct? 2013-12. From there on, and you can fill in some of the gaps, but my friend uh, has traveled the South several million times, understood uh, food ways. Um, in 2016, he was, um, I guess, awarded is the right, named as a TED fellow, one of ten on the globe, and in 2017, his newly published book, The Cooking Gene, which was published to wide, both academic and cultural everyday praise, uh, would go on in 2018 to win the James Beard Award for Best Writing and Best Book, and is the first time by an African American. some badass cornbread. <laughs> <laughs> the kind of street cred that you have to have uh, in your bones, or at least through practice. Whatever. You can't just fake. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. Um, and uh, it's, we're, we're just so lucky to have Michael here. When I put together and curate this series, I reach out to a lot of my friends within the national food media. I'm always saying, come to Madison. We'll take you to travel and things like that. Um, and so many of them have said yes, so I'd love to come next year. Michael immediately said yes, but please understand that uh, when I talked to him the other day, he said, I can, I can talk to you about my recipe, but I am back to back to back to back to back to back to back. This man hasn't slept in his own bed. You may not even know what it looks like anymore. It's been so long. Um, and tomorrow you're going to Portland, Maine by train simply to avoid TSA. Yeah. That tells you how much someone travels right there. Yeah. So there's these little tells when you get to know somebody, and that is, that's one of them. Uh, so what did I miss in your bio, and how did you, first of all, what moved you to, um, to go out of the space that you were in, start doing these uh, historic plantation dinners where you were cooking within the ethos, ethos and the techniques and the ingredients on the time frame that uh, your ancestors would have cooked on plantations and reworking that narrative for the rest of us? Um, first was to push back on the narrative that only white folks did this history. Mm -hmm. I remember when I, <laughs> the presentation in Maryland was uh, a lot of people, a lot of people were there, and they were like, well, why do you do this? And I said, to be contrary as hell. <laughs> right. To be a thorn in the side of people who don't represent me. They weren't satisfied. They're kind of unhappy about it. Mm. I, I guess I was I guess I was supposed to like be male Alice Walker or something. I don't know. Um, 
But no, that's not what I was doing. I was like, mm -mm, I'm so tired of going into historical spaces and seeing um, retired white women portray the culinary history of our ancestors. The lack of history. That's like, first of all, that disconnect. So that, you know, when you walk into those spaces, you can feel like, oh, I'm not being challenged. Uh, you know, when you walk into that space and there's a black person doing that cooking, mm -hmm. representing that history, you gonna feel some kind of way no matter who you are. Mm -hmm. Versus when you walk in and there's a little lady with a body on it. <laughs> I made mean, you guys some cookies, get out of here. <laughs> no, no, you didn't make me nothing. You weren't making it then, you ain't making it now, huh? <laughs> well, get out. Um, that's, yeah, that's our work you get out. Uh, I'm not afraid to say it. Um, look, y'all came for a thrill and I came to give it. But really, you know, I, I, was, I was really tired of being, I would go to color historian meetings, and I was the only person of color. And I would go to these other things with food history. I remember going to, um, I was in, one of the biggest things for me when my mom was still alive, was, in way, was to be invited to the Oxford Symposium on Food and Cookery. At Oxford University, St. Catherine's College in England. I have the books. They were a Christmas present, and that's—I mean, they are—they are their own Bible. And for yeah, history. yeah. It's like every year they do this humongous thing, and I'll never forget when I, I remember that was Sidney Mintz was there when he was still alive, Claudia Roden, Ken Alvala. I mean, all the, everybody was anybody in academic right. and cookbook writing, food history, from all around the world, and I was the only black man. For anywhere on the planet at this at this thing, and I was one of five people of color, mm -hmm. and I was one. I was. I was either one of the only other, or, basically, the only representative of people of African descent. Wow. I think I would think there was I think there were two of us, and five out of several hundred people. I would have thought so much more of the Oxford. And I didn't know how to. Well, it's expensive. The thing about it is. It's expensive, and I was invited, but they didn't pay a cent. Yeah. They just said, come here, present your paper. And I couldn't, could not do it. My yeah. mother told me, she says, oh, no, you got to go. Yeah. This is big. This is important. Yep. You've got to go in front of these people and prove that you are as good as they are and that your, your, your people's story is as important. I got up there, and they were very challenging. And Claudia Roden, who I love, this was in the front row. And all these other like giants were in the front row. And I'm just praying I don't mess up. And I did my paper, and they asked me all kinds of questions. And they resolved before I even left the spot that I'd be publishing the book. Hmm. And um, I remember Claudia wrote and pulled me aside, and she says, in all my years of doing this, I've never seen anyone interpret this. Well, not, she didn't say interpret, but mm -hmm. write this history the way you do. And that was deep for me, because you know, I'm also Jewish, and I also write about Jewish food history and culture. And for which her, she knows quite a bit which, she know, which she wrote several Bibles of, right? Yeah, right. But I yeah. mean, just, it was just this attitude of, yeah, this is cool. This is, this is, you need to keep doing this. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, was the, uh, the layer of confrontation. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that I've, and it's not to be, con it's not to be mean or hurtful. It really is to just kind of like move us beyond this, you know, gospel that we've received, which is, you know, okra, black eyed peas, watermelon, and rice. Ain't those Negroes so nice? You know, the contribu contribution, right? We tell children about the contribution of Native Americans as if they brought this uh, offering to the table of Western civilization and in exchange got smallpox blankets. Yeah. That's not a contribution, yeah. that's extortion. So, I mean, we teach our history in that kind of way. And it was just the fact that for us, if you're a native, if you're African, um, diaspora, if you're in any number of marginalized people, you have to confront all this trauma mm -hmm. before you can even get into your own thing, your own story. The other people don't have to do. Right. They don't have to work through that mess to get to a point of taking pleasure in the act of cooking. 
Mm -hmm. For us to take pleasure in our culture means we have to wade through a river of trauma. But once we take pleasure in our culture and learn how to do so and root ourselves, that is the antidote to rootlessness. Right, right. The opposite of appropriation is me knowing my source code. Yep. The opposite of me being aimless and rootless and anchorless is me having two solid feet in the ground roots to my people mm -hmm. and with my, my brain being the next place where the other people will come from. Mm -hmm. So that's the solution. And it, it's hard work. It's not easy. You know, you, you're, you're a little kid, you're a little black kid, and you hear the word slave for the first time, which I prefer the word enslaved. But you hear the word slave for the first time, you're like, what's that? Who? And you open up these books, and you see these scary pictures of people doing awful things to people who look like you. And there's no one, and there's, there's no one to sit you down and actually say to you, okay, deep breath. You will grow up in the world where the shadow of this baggage will follow you to the day you die. There's no escaping it. The best solution, the best thing you can do is, no one tells you that. Mm -hmm. But then you learn that your food comes from that, right? And that's exalting. Yeah. Yeah. And you learn that your, everything that makes you, gives you that um, black girl excellence and black boy joy comes from that. Mm -hmm. And then at some point you come to some point of self-realization that you can either roll with this and excel and, and, and stay on the shoulders of giants or you can flail. Mm -hmm. And that's a big part of our, our food world. I mean, some of us went on to be sushi chefs and some of us went on to do high French cuisine because we were trying to escape. Right. The bubble that people put us in of only doing so-called soul food, whatever that meant to them. Where real reality is we can do anything. Mm -hmm. And we are, we're able to do anything. We have done every kind of cuisine. Um, and, and also we forget that we're not just monolithic. You know, um, my, my good friend Sharon Morgan in Kent State told me about her grand, uh, just hanging out, talking to her. And she's like, oh yeah, my great-grandfather Garrett Morgan, who invented the stoplight. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, what? That, that dude is just, had the picture and everything. I'm like, oh my gosh, he even looks like him. And his wife was Czech. <laughs> Can you imagine? Black and white couple, 1910 in Ohio. Mm -hmm. Both got fired for being married to somebody of a different race. Mm -hmm. But she grew up with Czech food and African-American food side by side. We forget that, that black good. people carry those legacies. You're damn right it's good. Yeah, that sounds good. We, we, we're, we're that, you know, my people grew up eating Hungarian food in Pittsburgh, yeah, et cetera. So we have all these different like roots and ties and branches, and we, we, we do it effortlessly. But people forget that we're not a monolithic people. So while you're cooking those dinners, the yeah. reenactment dinners, the Well, let's dinners, call them interpretations. interpretations. I don't reenact that's slavery. Right. That's right. Thank you. The interpretation dinners. Ben Carson does that. <laughs> Candace Owens. No, don't. Diamond and Silk. Okay, no, good we'll calling. Don't be in that category because I know that the pyramids were not used for grain storage, okay? Look. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell him about how fantastic the bakeries were right. that were placed there for the enslaved people that actually built those pyramids right. uh, and that culinary store. But we digress. While you're cooking those dinners mm -hmm. on the plantation, how did you make the choice or did you make the choice to not be the angry chef? Because when you cook angry, it goes into the food. Because, you know, I don't know how to make chocolate pie, Kyle. Um... <laughs> we got in here I mean I mean so I remember one time someone asked me and my my chef brother Harold but you guys don't it's good that you guys aren't angry and we stopped and said no 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 we are angry but we're not bitter hmm. we want to us to have you learn is so much more important mm -hmm. to show you you know our non cool side why would I show it to you anyway right you're a contemporary person who can make the choice to buy into. See, people buy into those behaviors. They opt into them. Mm -hmm. You can opt out of them, like homophobia and misogyny. You can opt into them because it gives you some kind of 
payoff, right. emotional, whatever. Or you can opt out of it and just deal. If you opt out of it, I'm, I'm cool. If you opt into it, we ain't cool. But I figure if you're there and you want to listen and learn, then it's my obligation to teach as a, as a teachable moment. Mm-hmm. It's got nothing to do with you know, my anger or your guilt or whatever. Those are, those are supplementary. It's not even icing on the cake. Um, well, so you hopscotch, because we both know lots and lots and lots of chefs. Yeah. On the path to their voice, they had to go through an angry phase, right? Mm-hmm. They had to do that Herculean descent into Hades and then figure out something, right? Okay. And yeah. come back different on the other side. Yeah. But you weren't searching for your voice. You were searching for your ancestors. Right. That's a different thing. Yeah. And for me, the reason why I went on the Southern Discomfort Tour in 2012 was because I was... Still waiting for that liquor sponsorship. Yeah, right? people, people, yeah. right? <laughs> people are still waiting. Still waiting. <laughs> um, still waiting for that Paula Dean sponsor. <laughs> Like Mariah Carey's, I don't know her. <laughs> um, there is, there is this. That's there's actually a, a Louis the Fourteenth. There's, I don't know that person. Uh, <laughs> appropriation. Um, <laughs> but really, but really, um, I people started dying, memory started fading. Mm-hmm. I knew my mom didn't have a lot of time. Um, my dad, I didn't know how long. My my dad just turned eighty, so I guess. He's still rolling. But um, there was this lack, and I didn't want to, something was bugging me. Something told me, either you do this now mm-hmm. while your grandfather's still alive. My grandfather made it to 99, you know, mm-hmm. with a month to go until he was 100. Whoa. You, you know, 140-something living descendants yeah. to live to see his great-great-grandchildren. So I had, to, I had to get his DNA. I had to get his cheek swab. I had to get other people's cheek swap. I had to go track down relatives, distant parts of my family, knowing that they might have the only clue to parts of our identity that was lost. Mm -hmm. I had to go to these places because some of them were being cordoned off, blocked up, locked away, graves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My people's names on them, on Hunt Club property, I had to trespass to get to. Mm. You know, I just, just, it was a feeling of I don't have time. Yeah. There's no more right. time. Right. You've got to do this now. Yeah. And you had yeah. no time yesterday. Right. Yeah. And then I'm glad I did it because the book has in it. And well, my life, my mind, my soul has been nourished by the fact that now I have more of the connected tissue. Yeah. You know, I, I here's the deal. I you know, there are cookbooks. I mean, the cookbooks are nice and they're fun and everything. But <laughs> well, they're not remunerative. Not with everybody going to the Googles for recipes. It's not, it's not why you... So writing a food narrative, food memoir, to me was very important because I remember going to the Rogers for Cookbook Conference in 2011. Um, 2012, sorry. And, you know, Francis Lamb and... Um, all the folks who were, you know, Joe Nathan was there and Andrew Smith. And all David Lee, all these people who were like at that time, mm-hmm. the only yeah, folks yeah. doing right. food blogging in PR, right. New York Times, Melissa Clark was there, right. blah blah blah. Right. Yeah, on the intelligence. The, the side. upper yeah. echelons of like food writers, and there I was, again, black, gay, Jewish, Southern me, totally out of the loop. And I remember someone who I love and respect told me something I've heard a lot in my life, which is, maybe they don't know you and you too much. Hmm. Okay, she didn't say it in a mean way, she just said it. And so then I got this feeling in my gut saying, if they don't know me, then they will never know other outliers who have just as an important story to tell. Mm-hmm. This ain't about me, it's about the fact that if we keep this, keep food writing and food journalism and food criticism, cri- food, being a food critic and being a restaurateur and being a chef in one bubble, we will never progress in the right. food industry. Yep. If we only see if it's all a bunch of white boys with beards and tattoos, it's not gonna do anything. Mm-hmm. If it was just white women, who, Ina, the Ina Gardens, and, mm-hmm. and who was that ex-con's name? Martha Stewart. <laughs> if, it's just, if it's just them. Then, oh um, God, no tattoos in prison. I, I mean, we don't have to be Smith anymore. <laughs> Think about this, we don't have to be Smith anymore. Yeah. Or Ned Lewis. Or, well, I mean, think about this. 
And the Lewis was our grandmother, but B. Smith was our, you know, our beautiful hostess who had this international style and grace and this eloquence and language to her. And we, we're losing that to Alzheimer's. You know, we had G. Garber for a hot second. And G. Garber made me feel good because he was big, black, and sexy. <laughs> and, you know, a bear, you know? You know, he's a straight boy, but just, just for me to see a big black man, handsome as hell, cool, cooking. All right, I still, I Made still... me go, wow, because, you know, traditional image of black cooks is subservient, mm -hmm. old, superannuated, and decrepit. Yeah. And there you are, you have this beautiful queen and you have this beautiful king doing a thing. Or Patrick Clark, if he had Or Patrick thing. Clark back in the yeah. day. Yeah. But I mean, Patrick Clark didn't have Food Network Cooking Channel presence. Right. You know, the Neelys did. Yeah. Um, for, and by the way, for a couple that almost procreated on camera every week. <laughs> I was really shocked about that divorce. I was like, dang! <laughs> I used to feel like they used to be blood. Like this. Carson got the first cooking show in America on WPR back in the 60s. 50s. So you have Carson Gully out of Madison, Rick Carson, yeah. right? Yeah. You have Lena Richard yeah. from New Orleans, who, be, who actually at Colonial Williamsburg was their culinary advisor. Mm hmm. Now they talk about period this and period that, but they wanted the best in Southern um, food publicity to be their advisor. Mm -hmm. So we have this giant, and Carson Gilly had that amazing spice collection, right? Mm -hmm. He made his own spices and flavoring, and Lena Richard is doing her thing, but never really got the recognition they deserved. So we have this, we have this long history of Patrick Clark right up to the line, right? Yeah. Leonard Richard, Carson, right up to the line. Mm -hmm. This long history of other chefs and people right up to the line, and then where are they in our cultural memory? You know? Mm -hmm. So the whole thing with Paula Dean, people, some people call it, I didn't say, first of all, the idea of taking down a woman is some weird misogynist hetero, hetero idea that I'm not even familiar with. Um, <laughs> I'm like, whatever. But I asked her to come to a dinner. Yeah to share in the food the enslaved people put together. That's why I was so elegant you know, and compassionate. Yeah, but, uh, but I didn't want her boom, to... You're like, oh, right, but I didn't... But my whole conversation was about the fact that people will, people will still talk about Paul Prudhomme. We'll talk about Justin Wilson, mm -hmm. who wasn't even actually Cajun, you know? <laughs> they'll talk about, you know, uh, Tyler Florence, and they'll talk about Paula Dean, but they will forget us. And Paula D running around talking about, oh, my grandma might have been a whole cake girl. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? And then, you know, it's funny to me because as she says this nonsense, then they go to like, they have her, who do you think you are, ancestry show? And she's like, I come from poor, humble Southern folk. No, she didn't. Her great, great, great was the one of the biggest slaveholders in Georgia. Uh, like, baby, you want a whole cake girl. Morally, morally talk about it. <laughs> Let's talk about it. So that's, that's why I got so fired up, and I'm glad I did. If that, if that is the angry period you want, then that's what, I, that's, what I, that's what I bring to you. Because I really did want to do this kumbaya thing that John T. Edge and other people laid out. Mm -hmm. The difference is, they just people didn't want me in a conversation. I didn't have any money. I didn't have five degrees for nothing. Right. You know, nobody in the food world who did food history, culinary history, gets has a degree in culinary history. It's all, it's all a internal passion. It's got nothing to do with, they're all like former accountants and lawyers and yeah. scholars. Well, they don't know anything about culinary that I don't know. Because I mean, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, it's the Wild West, I know. You do your own it's the Wild West and you earn your way up through it by doing proper scholarship, exactly. presenting your paper at the right spaces, mm -hmm. and knowing the right people. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't just drink anymore and then all of a sudden somebody has a book deal. It doesn't work that way anymore. You gotta hustle, and I can sell salt to a slug. <laughs> <laughs> so moving forward, uh, there's a Southern Discomfort Tour. That was really, if I understand you, the, the inspiration for what became the cooking gym. Mm -hmm. 
So tell us about then that tour and that process, and we go, we're going to cook in a little while. Right. So there was a book. In 15 minutes or less. Right. There was a uh, there was a, um, a book. There was a documentary, and I forget my brain. Too late. I'm not ready to like off. Oh. Okay. So the documentary was it was called Finding Someone about the person's name, and it got to me. This young man, black young journalist from New Jersey goes to North Carolina, and he eventually finds this white man who's a descendant of the family who owned this family, he has the same exact name as that. Hmm. And he like, works in tobacco field for a day to find out what that's like mm -hmm. down in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. And he goes through the whole process, and he did his DNA, and he, like me, like me, is Ghanaian, part Ghanaian, mm -hmm. goes back to Ghana, and I said, yeah, dude, this is. I gotta do that. This is you. I gotta do that. Yeah. Um. And I rem I remember like the like the f emotion I got from this documentary. Like this is what it means to really confront yourself, mm -hmm. to really like look into your soul and be like, okay, you know, Yusuf can tell you like what that what that means. You don't know you don't know what the hell you're doing until you walk the door of no return. You don't know who you are until you go to the village mm -hmm. and you like you're surrounded by people who who say the first thing they say was welcome home. Mm -hmm. You don't know what you're doing until you can you you walking in the marketplace and you begin to see people in your family. Mm -hmm. You don't know what you're doing until you've gone to to the, the real south. And what for me was a big flashback was I remember when I was a little boy. My father took me to South Carolina. And I remember we'd go up to North Carolina, 85. And there, there was a sign, welcome to North Carolina. This is clay country. Oh. And, uh, We're here, brother. We're here, brother. and I remember being scared because I thought it was just a ghost. I thought it was a ghost, right? I thought, OK, they got a ghost here. I'm scared now. <laughs> and I didn't understand. I didn't understand. My father, I said, God, I said, Daddy, I gotta go pee. <laughs> and my father had the jar. <laughs> and I said, okay, <laughs> <laughs> And then my father says, okay, go on, man. Go by the side of the field, and I pee and I break the jar back. My father, my father goes, what's wrong with you? Why did you bring me the pee back? <laughs> and, and my father goes, I said, I'm like, basically, like, where's my cookie? You know, <laughs> do, you know, back in back in that day, you doctor's office, I pee, you give me cookie. <laughs> and so you were the canning even though. Right. <laughs> oh. Um, you know, I could go bad places, but I'm not. Thank you. Um, some of y'all have too many gay friends. And and it, my father said to me, no, I wanted you to understand that when I was your age, I could not go to the gas station bathroom. Mm -hmm. Color. And I said to my father, like me, like crayons. And it was a really sweet moment in my life of conversation. Because my father, for all our issues in life, in, in 10 minutes, he taught me about a world that I would never know, that I had to know about. And he was really thorough about it. I, I, every time I every time I like my father, I thank him for that. Because he taught me. It taught me like what he went through. He said the reason why he became went to the Marines is because he desperately wanted to be equal. He was willing to go to Vietnam and die for this country uh -huh. because when he was growing up, he saw the humiliations he experienced, his father experienced, and he said, I can't do this. And so for me, that was big time. But of course, I had a mom who fought through all kinds of, as a woman, as a black woman, who lived in several countries growing up, England, Kenya, America. I had a grandmother who was a race woman, which is our speak for someone who's really, That's, that was an old way of saying woke. Mm -hmm. Being a race woman, being a race man. And uh, I had a grandfather who was kind of stultified. He was really brilliant, but he only go so far in society. Another grandfather was very proud of being in the country. 
Mm -hmm. Well, overall, it's his last days mm -hmm. with the shirt and tie, yes. And they had, had, that, had that thing going on, but was really proud. I love my way my grandfather spoke. I was very proud of the way he spoke. Well, y'all going? Mm -hmm. so y'all fit to go to the stove? Mm -hmm. That kind of thing, that language. And so for me, having going been on the getting on the road with my ex-partner, um, what did what did um, Mara, um, Abramovich say? The artist, an artist should never fall in love with another artist. Mm -hmm. An artist should never fall in love. This is three times. I can spell. In other words, don't ever do problems with someone you love because right. you're not going to end up loving them at the end of the. Something's going to happen, mm -hmm. and it kind of did. We didn't hate each other, but at the same point in time, things changed. <laughs> You know, because I was taking away from his passion for his stuff. Because I was really absorbing a lot of energy. But it was transformative for us both because we spent months on the road together. Mm -hmm. We crowdfunded to earn money for $8,000. I know, $7,000. Cheap. I remember. That was cheap back then. <laughs> and I remember the, the money for the DNA test went to a car repair. And I was so mad. But you know, all those states, Maryland and Texas, Missouri and Florida, everywhere but Oklahoma, mm -hmm. thanks for that too. And um, you know, I, that, I didn't know what was going to become. Later on, after Paula Dean, I was, fresh, was frustrated because I couldn't get a book deal. Because I wanted to write about, I wanted to write, you know, solid stuff like Virginia African American foodways. You couldn't get a book deal because there's a higher power that was getting in your way so that you would write the book that we all needed you to write. I shall, yes. I, I received that. I received that. And I was fresh. I was, I was angry. And ooh, calling people, why did you do that? And then next year, <laughs> like, Paula Dean happened. I just stopped teaching Hebrew school, particularly Hebrew school. I said, no, I can't do this anymore. And I've got anything else in my life. i got to really get into this. <coughs> Sorry, y'all. And so, I'm, so I did it. And you know, I quit, retired from it, I guess. And then next thing I know, um, Paul Dean didn't happen. And you know, in the world of social media, if you don't hop onto it, mm -hmm. it's done. Mm -hmm. like nine days later, it was a long, prolonged response. Like, I wrote it in one take. Yeah, hop. In the library. In a, in a hop, 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 hop. Yeah, a lot of luck because the power went off. Yeah. And so I just did that, and then I. Oh, the power went off one time. I pressed the button, and the power came back on. Then the power went off. <laughs> and then I just waited there in darkness for about 20 good minutes. And by the and when this was the scariest moment in my life, the power came back on, and my phone would not shut up for 18 hours. And people were tweeting it. Yeah. And then around 4 o'clock in the afternoon, Huffington Post contacted me and said, can we read? How did you really get my number up? They have their ways. They republished it. And then it kept going and going. And then within seven days, I had 13 agents. Mm -hmm. Like, come on, let's do this. What do you have for us? And then I realized I had this entire project that I had spent a lifetime working on with a lot of different trips to the south, and I had more to go, and that's how that happened. Mm -hmm. You know, I, that whole thing about the closing the window and opening the door and all the nonsense, it's real. Mm -hmm. if, if, you, if you want it to happen that way, it's real. It's, it's not easy. No. But, um, how did your yeah. soul transition, uh, and then we'll cook, but how did your soul transition? I asked this of Samin Nasrat last night when I sat down with her. I asked this of Michael Pollan years ago when I sat down with him. Uh, anybody in this kind of, when there's a quick turn, how does your soul transition from being Michael Twitty to being Michael Twitty? Well, I how do you keep your center? I was always a diva, honey. <laughs> Who put on his grandmother's sunglasses and had his? I mean, I I, I was a much better dresser than I, mean, I used to. I used to love to wear ties, sweater vest, and the shirt, and the collar out. And I'm in that picture going like this, huh? And I had my Fisher Price cooking set. And 
A jet from an early age. Picture of me, picture of me at three years old, opening up the Webster's Collegiate Dictionary mm -hmm. to to look to look up my first big word, hermaphrodite. <laughs> I was a bizarre child, <laughs> um, but you know now you work through it. It's 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 tough. You know, the other day ago, I mean, we'll cook after, but let's check this out. <laughs> and I was looking at uh, what's her name. And we're not going to stop talking about. We're not going to stop. We're not going to stop. Yeah, right. But our, what was it? Princess Marvel, right? Okay. And she's been looking at her face when they were like, "Are you okay?" And she's like, "Start to break down." Well, I'm like, "Yeah." Can we check on our system? She, I mean, this is ridiculous. You go from, she's already famous, but she didn't know how, what real famous was. Mm -hmm. Until you can't sleep. People have a camera on your face all the time. They're watching every move, what you wear. Some things are good, some things are horrific. You got this family judging you. You're already different. And that's like, yeah, it gets kind of tough. People, you have to learn, fortunately, I had a lot, you know, I had a lot of, it's the, this game, knowing you, knowing Xander Katz, knowing Nancy McDermott, um, knowing Psyche Williams Forsen, knowing Sammy, you talk to each other about what you go through. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And one of the most important things is that centering. Yeah. Because I remember one time Sandor I went to one of his presentations, and it was my first clue that you had to be, have a strong stomach to do this. There two women in line, and I flipped through his, that was in his newer book on fermentation. And they saw rescues involved in meat. And in their bubble mm -hmm. mind, mm -hmm. Sandor, because he was a this natural fermentation dude, he could only be vegetarian and vegan. Mm -hmm. And they were they were saying he stepped off the cliff. Who? Yeah, they were yeah. just like they were, it was almost a cancer moment for them. Yeah, right. Like, what is this? I don't, I don't know. And I'm standing back in the lab because I know him, but also in my stomach I went, see, that's gonna be you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you gotta be ready. You gotta be ready for people tell you, why are you wearing slave clothes? Why are you gotta act like a slave? What kind of self, what kind of black man are you? Oh, how do I know Michael Twitty's pro black? Oh my god, he's picking cotton in the picture. What what is this nonsense? Or better yet, look at this guy. He makes plantation goods so white people can feel good about slavery. Cos or cosplay. Yes, right. Or the uh, co right, Mr. Cosplay. I remember I was a fat dropout that like the cosplay slavery? Yeah. Mr. Washington Post reviewer at my own hometown. Mm -hmm. Asshole read two pages of <laughs> <laughs> um, born in Spain. At least have another brother or sister review my damn book. Mm -hmm. Not some yovo. Mm -hmm. eh. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean beyond just that, there's the other version. You obviously hate white people. Mm -hmm. How could you hate white people so much? I'll well, be giving you. Oh, oh. <laughs> well, there is a long list. Well, <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. We won't know the atomic chemistry. But, like, for real, like, the other the flip side was I hate white people. I'm part of the great genocide of white people. I'm gonna make white people commit suicide and a mass guilty suicide. Like, <laughs> with dreams. And I mean, this, there's no, and, but then you have to remember something. Centering does not mean listening to that 5% mm -hmm. that is sent from having to challenge you and make you grow. Mm -hmm. Centering means listening to the tons of people I have met who go, I am a white southerner. I never thought about things this way. Mm -hmm. I'm ashamed, mm -hmm. but I'm proud to know you and call you family. Mm -hmm. It's it's somebody going, mm -hmm. wow! I had to take my my grandfather back from um, South Central LA to Louisiana. He had been. This is a great migration, mm -hmm. and we went and found all the places where my family is from, mm -hmm. and I got to see them with my grandfather. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Twitty. And the woman from Bosnia who came and told me to Toronto, you don't know how brave you are. And I said to her, wait a minute, hold up, you from Bosnia. <laughs> and she says, she stopped me, right? So she says, I know what you think, what you think of me in that line, but 
we have different kinds of braveries. Mm -hmm. And yours is just as valid as mine. Mm -hmm. So you have to be willing not to do the, the, the model minority thing, which is I have to defeat my next accuser. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Great. And you have to do the healthy thing, which is the mean balance. Mm -hmm. how, am I, how am I affecting change in the world? Am I doing what I set out to do? Mm -hmm. What I set out to do was write a book that traced my family's story from Africa to America, from slavery to freedom, mm -hmm. with me being very self-reflective about what it means to cook and be black in this country, mm -hmm. to be an American, to tell my American story, our American story, and to help other people of color find their way, mm -hmm. and to tell our African and Caribbean cousins and Brazilian cousins and Haitian cousins, we are one people. We are a sovereign people, lest we forget the African diaspora family. We're a proud people. We are, we're, we're frustrating people. I mean, y'all are some frustrating black <laughs> <laughs> But without you, then we have no love, no art, no God, and we have to keep striving together. But at the same time, we have to work with our neighbors, friends, and hidden family to make a better world. Mm -hmm. we, the question, if I had to ask, if I had to ask you know who a question mm -hmm. to his face, yeah. it'd be like this. Do you really want another 150 years of cold civil war? Is that really the legacy you want to leave? Mm -hmm. Is it a legacy you want to live in? Or do you want to sit down the table with brotherhood? You know, which, which do you want? And that's a question I ask anybody who reads my work. Are we going to do this peace, brotherhood, sisterhood thing? Are we going to leave a better world? Are we going to continue to go on this hamster wheel where nobody gets out alive? That's it. Let's cook. All right. Okay. Well, I just have to do a little preamble. So I asked Michael graciously through email to do this, and he said yes, I think I could fit it in, and everything was on the calendar, and then a lot of time elapsed, and I texted him like a stalker, <laughs> like five times. Not unusual. And then he, <laughs> uh, when your name's on something with mine in an appearance, it's true, and I said, dude, we need a recipe. When can you call me back? And. Uh, as a testament to our friendship, I have a six-month-old that was not sleeping very well that day, so I took her out on a walk in the baby ergo because that knocks everybody out. And she was asleep, and he called me back, and I took the call. Because I wanted to know what this recipe was. <laughs> so, with that preamble, what are we making, my friend? Um, we're making something that my grandmother used to make, but also, um, it's a southern delicacy. It's a, a southern version of chicken curry, but that's way too simple. Yeah, simple. It is more, it is a clear example of how in the early American South, um, in the colonial antebellum South, black cooks took influences from all over the world and made them work. What makes us not purely South Asian is clearly some of the ingredients being used um, also, there is curry, there are, there's kitchen pepper, which is in my book, which is all the sweet spices and black pepper, white pepper and red pepper mixed together. No salt, just, it's a kind of like an early American, um, you know, seasonal. Um, they use a lot of mace and nutmeg and things you wouldn't use mace and nutmeg in. Mm -hmm. I did a, a taping with Padma Lakshmi recently. She called it <laughs> Black People's Garam Masala. <laughs> um, that for all the the heat I endured that day, um, the funniest thing she said to me was, "I'm like hot. I'm like dripping. I'm like a big melting chocolate sickle." And I'm like, "Girl, how are you not hot?" And she goes, "I'm Indian, bitch." <laughs> I was like, I won the, 
And so I'm like, and we're on camera, and I didn't expect it. I just died. I just <laughs> fell out, like, boom. She, I have to say, I've never had that high of an estimation of Padova. She's doing a very cool series that will eventually make it to stream about the history of a whole bunch of culinary pathways. She just spent four hours with a uh, fourth generation German chef, a friend of mine in Milwaukee, who <coughs> still have a restaurant. And um, they're my touchstone for things like uh, Hassenpfeffer and things like that. Hassenpfeffer. And, yeah. And I, I mean, it's I very like, German. The same Padma, the one that I've seen. But yeah. She's, so this should be a really cool, thoughtful series. I applaud her for that. She's uh, one of my biggest supporters. Like, I remember the day that she tweeted, she Instagrammed and tweeted me. And you know, she got that face, right? That make your brother want to switch. And the next thing you know, she has my book and she's like, I love this book. And I'm just like. <laughs> and then not to be outdone, Nigella Lawson, oh. hair flick, does her love message. And I'm just like, what? <laughs> so I was, I was getting life. Yeah. Cause I had like these, these Two incredible women who inspire me and look effortless mm -hmm. at what they do in the world of food. Mm -hmm. Be like, this is, and she stole it from her assistant. She was like, I'm taking this book. Bye, thanks. <laughs> and bought him a new copy, like, but like, was like, it's mine now. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's, that's cool. Yeah. I've, been, I've been afforded some really happy, great experiences. And every now and then you have to look at yourself and go, God, I have an interesting life. <laughs> you know, my parents didn't have all that all the time. Right. You know, it's not just the raising of me, but just, you know what I'm saying? Not being able to live up to their best selves because of the nonsense they grew up in. You know, it, was, I didn't, it wasn't until my mom, until I was in my late 30s, my mom was sick that I finally looked at my mom one day and said, you used to be like me. And it was kind of a bittersweet day because I was like, yeah, she wasn't born to be your mama. She was born to be Pat. Uh -huh. And Pat was a little girl and Pat went to school and Pat was really brilliant, but Pat couldn't always do the things she wanted to do because she was a woman growing up in a time when women didn't always have access and abilities. Like my mom told me one time, you know, I had to ask your, my younger brother, your uncle, to co-sign so I have a place on my own. But that's how things were in the, in the 70s. Mm -hmm. You know, she explained to me what empowerment it was to be Ms. instead of just Miss or Mrs. To not have it, to not pursue an MRS degree. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. that kind of, that, my mom was real, and my father the same way. My father couldn't functionally read and write when he was 12. Mm -hmm. You know, he got, he went, occasionally he would go back with my grandfather lived in South Carolina and learned in a one-room schoolhouse, Jim Crow education. Uh, my grandmother could have been a number of things, but, and my other grandfather, he struggled, but he did get an education. Went all the way to half his master's. But I mean, again, he didn't have, wasn't able to live the life he wanted to live because of, you know, he had to leave his home, he'd leave Alabama. So I don't take for granted the opportunities that I have that even the past two generations couldn't have. Well, that gives so much more gravitas to your mother saying, go to that Oxford. Yeah. Go to that Oxford talk. My, my mother was my best cook, best teacher in terms of cooking. But not only that, she, for all of our stirring and drawing and, and stuff, mm -hmm. she taught me how to fight. Hmm. When, I, when you see me out there fighting on paper, <laughs> that's my mom. My mom tore up this girl in, in, in London, and so when she went to school in England, on the Isle of Wight, who decided to call her the N-word. And another Miss girl thought she was gonna get away with it, but within two seconds, that weave got snatched. <laughs> like, she, my mom was like a fighter. Would not, my mom actually took my, okay, I'll, we'll, we'll cook into this. But my mom, <laughs> my mom, remember one time my, my, my grandfather told my mother and sisters, get on in there and clean up the kitchen. No, we've already done our chores. Make the boys do it. No, it's girls' work. Mm. My mother took that broom and threw it in the ground and said, no, I have done enough. My sisters have done enough. Get those boys in here and teach them how to be men and clean back to themselves. Mm -hmm. You know what? 
<laughs> within five minutes, <laughs> guess what happened? The little boys got in their kitchen started cleaning up, and my mom and her just went to the movie theater. <laughs> Even her daddy couldn't tell her, mm-hmm. you ain't going to tell me who to be. Mm-hmm. So I was like, okay. But then when she had a son to the same with her, <laughs> <laughs> revenge. <laughs> but she said what I'm saying, she was that kind of person. She wasn't, she, injustice was a thing with her. And I learned how to like, look up, hold my head up. And my daddy was the same way. My, my father told me, if somebody calls you boy, tell them thank you because a boy has room to grow. Mm-hmm. Yep. This is our chicken. Are your hands clean? My hands are clean. Wash them. <laughs> there's, your, there's your authentic black cooking experience. Right there. <laughs> Baby, is your hands clean? <laughs> Don't make me wash them for you. But you ain't gonna like it. Where's our printout? I wanna make sure we're doing this right. Uh, I bet there's one in the crowd we could borrow, yeah? Yeah. Thanks, Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Okay, cool. So, um, by the way, if you don't have, if you have it, but if you lose it, the recipe's on my blog, and it's also um, Karan Lu yeah, and Toronto is- Star yep. redid it. You know, put it more in, like, recipe newspaper speak, which is probably better than the way I wrote it. Um, but, yeah. When I sent this recipe to the chefs here, I sent the Toronto Star article, and they wrote back, like, where's the recipe? And I said, well, it's in there. It's done up with a set bob. Here. <laughs> Just cover that set. Okay. You need a bit of kitchen pepper. And the thing about it is, well, you know, for me, food writing has always been about people, personalities, narratives, right? Yeah. But when I first started, every food blogger was exactly the same. Look at my food porn. Oh, God. Oh. oh God. As a working mom who wants to expand herself. Girl. I walked off a set once because they said, okay, this is the part where we do food porn. I said, first of all, that's a vulgar word, not the first one, the second one. And second of all, I'm done. I'm done. Because it's that's not. what this show's about. It's not. That's not. You're right. It's not about that. I'm not going to say who, uh, what the show was, but. Right. Uh, mm-hmm, well, well, we need more salt in this, baby. We can't cook without. The culinary school, I bet they've got salt. Let's see. So, uh, to your point, though, what you said. <laughs> it's your recipe, buddy. They miss the plus. Yeah. There should be a pound of salt on the table, though. <laughs> I love how I went to Nigeria once, and all of a sudden, I mean, I'm from, I'm from. Um, um, Nollywood. <laughs> Why are you running? Um. <laughs> to, to your point, uh, Paul Bertolotta once said to well, I said a couple times. Um, Kyle, rub talk. Food without a story. <gasps> excuse me, a meal without a story is just food. Yeah. Yeah. Get on in it too. I'm getting. I'm waiting for you to do more salt. Okay, go ahead. Okay. There you go. Jeez. Both sides. Oh, I'm, I'm a bossy. Yeah. Somebody in the kitchen. We chef only goes so far. See? All right, so what we're doing right now is we're, we're taking curry powder. Um, I have my favorite. Hit me with more salt. The little um, 10 canister of Madras curry powder. So we use in my house. Let's get some, yeah, but if you, if you like that, you can do Jamaican curry powder if you want to. You just a ch- little change of flavor, and that's good. And um, Kitchen pepper, of course, and you know a little bit of uh, poultry seasoning, and that's the rub for the chicken. And what we really want to do is, um, I got one more thing for you. I'm sorry. All right. Yeah. What we really want to do is make sure it's seasoned on multiple levels, because right now our job is just to get the chicken rubbed, let it sit for a second, and then fry the chicken. Um, let's see. Oh, yay, we have rice flour. So what we're going to do is we're going to um, kind of coat this after you get done rubbing that. Mm-hmm. And we're going to fry it up. 
Now, when I did this sketch, your samples will come out of that kitchen. When I did this sketch <laughs> for, um, yeah, we got more salt. Can I get some soap? Oh, yay! Soap, soap would be nice. Thank you, sir. After I Thank you, chef. Um, I did this dish for uh, a benefit dinner for for a culinary um, community school in Brooklyn, and I love the whole team, but the head chef. Was. Being a Jamaican lady, <laughs> young Jamaican lady, yeah. totally was like, you know what, I ain't doing it like that. And it was problematic because I understand that in Jamaica they make some mean curry chicken. But this was not the same. This is Country Captain. Country Captain is fried chicken that is then smothered in a stew that's eaten over rice. It is not curry chicken the way they do it. Now, I know that's a, this, this, kind of it's tomato tomato to some people, but you can taste it. Yeah. You know, our seasonings are different. Well, plus they brought Michael Twitty to this to do a recipe. Yeah, and, and to, I, then yeah. To, to put it out. So I'm very particular about how Quella have my recipes because sometimes they just don't do it right. I did a program with the JCC in Richmond. I really shouldn't call them out, but I'm just saying. And <laughs> some things were good, but I have a sorghum brine chicken and, and cabbage leaves. The cabbage leaves are not to be eaten. They just keep the chicken moist as it roasts. And not only they serve the cabbage leaves with the chicken, <laughs> which is bizarre, but it was covered in some disgusting hoisin sauce nonsense. Oh. And I was like, uh-uh. That's when I just put my foot down and said, from now on, unless I'm there to watch over the process or taste the food as it comes out, I can't do this anymore. I said, that's my grandmama them recipe. You don't do that. No, that's, that's, our, that's, that's intellectual property. I don't want you to mess up. I surely didn't want somebody to taste it and go, well, I, I was mortified. People said, oh, that's so awesome. I, like, oh. <laughs> I, can't, I can't with them, can't. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and you know, do our thing. Gotta, Rice flour? Yeah, let's get, some, let's get some oil heated up. Okay, in one of these? Yeah. There we go. Now this dish is from Charleston and Savannah, which I just came back from for the umpteenth time. Veggie oil, can I use it from here? Do you want me to use the chicken dredge oil? Use chicken dredge oil. Okay. Yeah, that's cool. And, you know, I remember one time I was at Colonial Williamsburg doing a, um, doing a presentation with, with um, Harold and this lady came in. She was fascinated by us, but she also said, I'm from Savannah and I never knew that all the, all the food I was eating was basically, you know, from West Africa. She did, I mean, where she's like, I love okra and black eyed peas and barbecue and fried chicken and Hop and John and Lemp and Susan, which is okra and rice. And I love collard greens and hot pepper and I live on that. I can't, if I, she's like, if I don't eat rice, it's like I haven't eaten. And I'm like, you know that very phrase you just said? <laughs> it's straight out of Sierra Leone in Liberia. Mm. And she, it was like, I felt bad for her in a way, but I also felt great because we enlightened her and she was receiving that knowledge. Mm -hmm. And now she couldn't live that life with blinders mm -hmm. ever again. And for a lot of our own folks, I love it when um, black parents bring their children in. And at first, the kids are like, oh, hey, hey, hey. Because <laughs> they're kids, right? And then I like say, come on over here. I make them do a little something. Ow, oh, OK. <laughs> and then 10 minutes goes by, 20 minutes, 30 minutes. All right, now, come on, we got to go. I don't want to leave. <laughs> I want to sit here with him. He gonna make me biscuits. <laughs> and it's beautiful because, you know, I tell our young, young kings and queens, I said, you know, you, you were free people of color as well. We were caterers and restaurateurs. And James Hemings was the first great American chef. He was Amen. a black man. And we're sitting there talking about it. <laughs> and I'm just like, you have greatness to live up to. And the food that you, you come from is really important, you know? They, you know, respect that food that comes out of your mom and dad's kitchen, comes out of grandma's kitchen, grandpa's kitchen. I said, this is, this is your heritage.
and they listen to you. Yeah. You get through to them, and they leave with a smile. And that, <coughs> it means a lot. It means a lot to know that maybe, just maybe, that torch gets passed on. One time, this, this kid, he was, um, you guys heating up, yeah? Yes. Yeah, put, so okay. let's put a little bit more in this, and okay. a little more grease in it. We got a popcorn. And he, I was oh, talking okay. about, yeah, the hot sauce and whatnot. And he goes, he smiles, and he turns his dad, he hit his dad, he's like, he must have been like 12, 13, hitting his dad in the arm going, yeah, like grandma, like North Carolina, that's how, yeah, that's how she does it, like the hot sauce on the table, and da 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 And I, and I, and I couldn't stop talking, but I, I got the biggest pleasure from that, from him relating to his father. First of all, I just love it when our fathers, are, you know, do anything. But it was this fact that they were sharing this moment like my father and I shared, mm. of knowing you're part of something bigger, a legacy, a heritage. And I just saw that love between them and I was just like, you know, this is the best. So for me, that's why I do it. That's why I do what I do. Because I, I just love, I love that part. I love that re re revelatory part. Or when people of different backgrounds like when I was, group, I did a classroom thing. I rarely do classroom work. I was fourth graders in Annapolis, Maryland. And I did, a pro, I did this whole program about slavery and whatnot, and food, et cetera. And there was this moment when this classroom, white, black, um, Asian, Latinx, and they all started talking to each other and going, oh, you eat that? I eat that too. Hmm. Oh. Yeah, I go hunting, and my father and I do this. And, oh, no, no, no. In my country, we do this. No, 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 we do that. Let's come to your house for dinner sometime. Yeah, I like that. Kids get it. They understand. And when I asked them to tell me what they were learning, every kid from every background could tell me the essential moral and ethical lessons of that lesson, that lesson plan, that day. And I was, I was so proud of those kids. There were a lot of them, 45 fourth graders. And they were awesome. Once I got them in, they were awesome. And they, were, they totally got it. And what's be, what the best part is, they understood they were not alien from each other. They were just different shades of human. And that's why I wanted them to do that. Okay, how are we doing? We're cracking a little bit. All right. Okay. Let's see if grandmama wet right there. That's what we do. I was on a panel, your James Hemming comment, I was on a panel here, and folks were talking about fresh food, and seasonal regional, and all that, and someone said, well, you know, it was so great when Jacques Pepin brought fresh food to America. <laughs> and I said, well. Even he would have laughed at that. Yeah, exactly. And, they, and then the, the follow-up comment was, yeah, we didn't have all these farmers markets, so imagine how hard it was. And I just kind of held my breath for a minute, and then I interjected over someone else, and I said, well, imagine how hard it was for Jane Tennant's. Mmm. <laughs> you ain't the average kind of John Brown, are you? <laughs> well, my point was, he's got this French training. He's supposed to be cooking great French food. Right. But he didn't have the ingredients coming from over there. I mean, it's true, Dr. Penn had the green beans and the cane. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Say what now? Well, like you couldn't get fresh green beans for the pen. But my point was. Wow. Yeah. I mean, think about it. That's like learning. That's like learning. Lassie wasn't really a collie. <laughs> <laughs> Is that true? No, but if it was, <laughs> that'd be like hurtful. Over dinner. With this, this, the college has a lovely chef table for all the visiting chefs that come for the series. And over dinner, the discussion quickly descended into Prince. <laughs> and the differences and similarities between Prince and Michael Jackson. Oh. Oh. And his relationship with Vanity. Oh. <laughs> May she rest in peace, Vanity. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's wrong with well, us? Not the character. <laughs> right, right, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Like, you know, I wish my name was Vanity. <laughs> Wouldn't be hot. Black King Chef Vanity. <laughs> <laughs>
Somebody, somebody's going to do that. The prison gene would have been completely different. <laughs> totally different. But I am going to do a, I am going to do a project on being a gay man on the kitchen. I heard something really expected, but really beautiful last night. This uh, white fella from Valdosta, Georgia, thereabouts, not really Valdosta, but near the Florida line, says to me, my grandmother, he said, first of all, he says, make the book out to Tom and Ray. OK, I knew you were a sister. <laughs> and then he goes, my grandmother taught me how to cook. And then, you know, boys didn't always belong in the kitchen when I was growing up. But my grandmother must have known something, something. Because she passed the recipes on to me. And that's such, it's a very common experience in a lot of different cultures, but especially black and southern culture. You know, so the grandma that's like hit to the job knows, all right, you ain't safe out of that world. But you're safe in here with me, and we're going to do this. And if you, ever, if you watch the show Pose, it's a really beautiful show on FX about the ball scene in, in New York in the 90s. Blanca, who was one of the trans characters in the show, she, there's this episode where her mother dies, and they never reconciled. But her mother left her cookbook, and she remembered that when she was little Blanca, as a boy, she was the favorite for the kitchen. And the, the cookbook becomes hers. And you know, now that she's the mother of the house, she passes on the Dominican recipes to her family, her gay family. So it's just, that's why these things don't have borders the way we assume they do. You know? We have some talks. Yeah. Right yeah. Oh. Bucket. Right bucket. Oh, the bucket. Thank you. <laughs> I'm not used to dealing with fancy kitchen. Fish spatula, if you want. To. <laughs> okay. So, we're not quite there yet. We're going to do two batches. Let me show you the first one. So where does the name come from for this dish? Some white man. <laughs> I mean, what's your captain? I mean, geez. No, but no, seriously, um, the name refers to trading spices, trading foods. Like I said, Charleston, Wilmington, Savannah. Mm -hmm. And then it spread to the Deep South. Mm -hmm. It's definitely not a Virginia dish. Okay. But, it, but, you're, but people need to remember that Southern food migrated. Mm -hmm. And it didn't stay in one spot. There was a time when Charlestonians thought, we are the only legit Southerners. And then within, a, within half a century, Texans are like, don't mess with Texas. <laughs> And Mississippi, Mississippi didn't even exist until 1817. Right. But you ask Mississippians who's Southern, and they write off people from North Carolina and Virginia. Yeah. It's hilarious because that's where their, parent, their great great grandparents came from. <laughs> so, this idea of what is Southern is really odd. Because even, like, even, it's like Midwestern. Okay, Midwesterners. <laughs> is. Oh. <laughs> You've been reading your senses, mommy. I see. <laughs> is Ohio the Midwest? Hell no. Yeah. Yeah. I need a show of hands. Yes? Is Ohio the East? Yeah. Yeah. Dang. Yeah. Wait a minute. Is Pittsburgh the Midwest? No. To us, Pittsburgh is, they say pop. They don't look at the ocean. <laughs> They're right on the Ohio border. That's the Midwest to us. What about, hold up. What about Iowa? Yeah. Absolutely. What about Indiana? No. Yes, it yeah. is. It depends. depends. If you're in Terra. No, it's not. If you're in Wilmington, yes, it is. It is a little Mason Dixon there. Yeah. What about, what about um, Illinois? Yeah. yeah. Even with like the lower part of Illinois? No. Uh, uh, it doesn't matter because all the bottom, the lower part of Illinois is owned by ADM Coco anyway, so it doesn't matter. It's like its own, it's like Vatican City. It's like its own nation. Oh, here's a tough one. Missouri. No. Hell no. No. <laughs> no. Misery. Misery. 
I, you know, I, Missouri, uh, Indiana, Illinois, Ohio. I think everything under seventy mm-hmm. is a little. Mm-hmm. Touch, touch little Appalachia, a little south, yeah. with a little east, with a little Midwest. Yeah. But then you ask Southerners, what's Kentucky? A quarter of them will say Midwest. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yep. And they're, they're referring to Louisville. <laughs> right. <laughs> but to, you gotta remember that some Southerners also, Appalachia is not the South. Right. But it is, it's Appalachia. It's the East. Okay, so last and other regional debate. Pittsburgh is an Appalachian city, there's no doubt. Okay, yes, I'll buy that. I mean, there's just no doubt. What can we put this on? We can put it on wardrobe for that. Some kind of cloth, I mean, you know. Yeah. You no question. Cool yeah, yeah cool rack is great. Cool, rack. cool. No question about that. So, I mean, yins, for God's sake. <laughs> or all Scots Irish. What are the Dakotas to a southerner? The, the, the frontier? <laughs> Southern Canada? Exactly. Right. It's Florida the South. Florida's the Florida's the same thing. Northern Florida is definitely the South. Southern Florida is Cuba. Yeah. Right. All right. Thank you, Chef Paul. Chef Paul Short, by the way. Hey, Chef. Sarah, the department. This whole series is his baby. Called me up two years ago and said it would be cool if we could do this. And I said, yes, it would. Let's make it happen. Yay. And a terrific host. All right. Big that's vision, people. Leadership. Not quite done. Big so we're going to do these, finish these off. Now, this one's rough for me, but I'm going to say it anyway. To me, and not just that's wrong, that's not my opinion, that's just history. Um, <clears throat> it gets complicated. Mm-hmm. I say if your state's history was largely shaped by cash crops, slavery, mm-hmm. and the plantation aristocracy, you're probably in the South. No matter what other things happen after the fact. I think you're absolutely <clears throat> out. So in Maryland, where I'm from, people get attitude, but I tell them all the time, like, you ought not get attitude about it because the, here's the bottom line. Let's turn this down just a tiny bit. Okay. I thank God every day that Abraham Lincoln locked up one third of the Maryland legislature. Otherwise, I wouldn't be talking to y'all right now. Without that one act, we might be in some serious trouble because Baltimore was the industrial capital of the Upper South. And it was a port city. And if they had control over Washington and Baltimore, oh, that looked too good for me and you, Yusuf. Ouch. So I'm very thankful for that. But people understand is that there's a line that you can see. And that line is where Southerners migrated to and where German and Irish people immigrated to. The reason why Indiana, Illinois, and Missouri have this kind of like southern lilt is because people from Maryland, Virginia, Tennessee, and Kentucky Mm -hmm. immigrated to those fertile areas, people who didn't have enslaved people to work for them. At the same time, Baltimore, Louisville, St. Louis, and Austin all have something in common. There are cities in southern states where during the 1840s, 1820s, 1840s, the Germans and the Irish migrated. So Baltimore becomes south by northeast, right. Kent, Louisville, south by Midwest, so thing with St. Louis, yep. and Austin south by Southwest. Like I said, you know, it has, very, it has nothing to do with climate or affiliation. It's the people that came. People who came from these places. Yep. And the thing about it is, I'll move this to the side. We no longer need that. They were essentially, um, they, weren't, they didn't buy into the plant, planter aristocracy thing, the British laid down. 
And if you were unwilling to do that, no go. So there it is. All right. For the sake of time, I would, you know what I want to do? I, I want to skip, skip out on the rice part, because the rice is just a base. And I want to focus on making the actual so the stuff. Rice would have gone in here. Yes. <laughs> but we're going to, for the sake of time, let's just do that. You OK with you? Yeah, yeah. OK. So these folks all have the recipe. Yeah. And uh, we're going to have you taste the Carolina rice. Don't worry. We're going to have samples. The very end. We'll see this, oh, like, maybe two more minutes. Sure. I got them now. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. And we'll just assemble the rest of the stuff. So this is the part that, you know, so we have all of our stuff to make the, the sauce. This is easy. Like in West Africa, all you got to do, what's this guy? Hmm. Ah, for the, for the taco. Mm -hmm. OK. So I get it. So you got the toppings here, and this is the part we need. Yes. Great. This is much more complex than the black eyed peas hummus that we made the first time. We yep. So, curry, tomato paste, ginger, bell pepper, tomato sauce, the oil to saute, a little bit of trafe stuff. <laughs> I ain't gonna tell you what it is. <laughs> we're gonna stick. We're gonna start with there. Because I want to get through this, and I want to have able to ask questions if you want to ask questions. OK, great. We're happy? Yes, um, we are. So let's get our spoon. Chair. So oh, I can use this one. For you, by the way? Kosher soul. Kosher salt? Kosher salt. So writing about being in Jewish, and I first started with, with our Muslim cousins. Mm -hmm. And my whole idea, OK, that's going to be really hot. So we're going to start all over again. I'll take this one. OK. That one's hot. What? Not that one, this one. Yeah. There we go. And it's important because, you know, there, there has been black Jewish culture history in the West for a long time. Um, and it's like people seem to believe we just came out of nowhere. Actually, we've been here since Moses and Zipporah, but whatever. Um, we need to get, get a family of that. I don't want that to smoke us out of. Now, normally, you know, if you sell that this is gravy, right? OK, yeah. here. I was going to say. Where should we put this? Put it right here. Yeah, it's really hot. That's really good brown stuff. That's fine. Mm -hmm. So, um, but people have culinary identities and lives that other folks don't acknowledge. And so I felt, for me, it's another part of my identity where it's just like, so how do you make all these pieces make sense? So it's a very different project. But it's essentially the same thing. How do you? If this, if one is how I deal with my heritage and history through the idea of race and food, the other part is how do I deal with my spirituality, faith, and peoplehood? Because mm -hmm. Judaism is a peoplehood, first and, first and foremost. It has nothing to do with whether you were born in Poland or Morocco. Judaism is about, are you a descendant, literally or figuratively, of Abraham and Sarah, and accept the Torah that Moses brought down on Sinai? And... You can be not religious and still be Jewish. There's, that's the thing about it. It's very complicated. And for the people who I interviewed for Kosher Soul, including interrogating my own identity, you know, one of my friends is from a family that's been black and orthodox for five generations. They're now a Hasidic family. They're Chabad. But they've always been Jewish and black, as long as they can remember, and have the, and have the paperwork, you know? That's one thing about us. People always assume we're converts. And no, that's not how it works. I have another friend who is married to a gay man, married to a conservative rabbi, who is happy to tell you he's a convert. I have other friends who are 
so-called mixed biracial, I don't, I don't really use those terms, who, you know, hey, my father and my mother, I grew up this way, we've been a part of who I am. And each one of those has a food story attached to it. What do you make for Shabbat, for your holidays? Mm -hmm. How do you celebrate Hanukkah and Kwanzaa? How do you do that? We can talk to our Muslim cousins. Very similar kind of stories about you know, their, you know, their upbringing, et cetera. Okay. Boom, rice out of nowhere. Yay. <laughs> Actually, out, out of a big, beautiful kitchen. Cool. So this is the easy part. Y'all can see it on the camera. It's actually rice. Garlic, ginger, oh my god, yes. Onion. Um, chef can tell you, you go to Benin, this is exactly how every stew, every everything starts. Garlic, onion, ginger, pepper. You know. So this is very not, if you know real South Asian cooking, especially from Kerala and Goa, you know this is not South Asian. So you're sweating down and you're building flavor at the same time? Mm-hmm. That's what you want to call it? <laughs> That's what I want to call it. So, you know, yeah, you're right. And um, we're going to let that go first, then the tomato paste. And we're going to add um, a little kitchen pepper. And grab the salt, please, sir. Other side. Oh, there we go. Okay, thank you. So when did you, when did this recipe come to you? When I was growing up. Yeah. My grandmother made red rice, country captain, which essentially came from the fact that her mother, her mother's roots from Alabama and Alabama, Alabama, but her great-grandmother was from South Carolina. And um, very light-skinned, very mixed. Um, her daughter used to say, I ain't no Negro. Ha ha, did my DNA? Yes, he was. <laughs> Sierra Leone, baby. <clears throat> but you know, we had issues like that in my family. Hmm. My grandma was very proud to be black, even though she had like gray eyes and red hair light skin, had a lot of issues from that. Her father was <clears throat> a rich brown skinned man, rich in color, not in wallet. He was a really strong person. You know, his wife's family treated him like garbage till the grandchildren started showing up. And he was very proud. My grandmother used to say to me all the time, all right, Joe Todd, call me by my Grand, my great grandfather's name. And he was short, like me. And he was fun. He was a lot of fun. Good, very good with kids. He, didn't, he would never beat his children. So, mother, meaning my great grandmother, would send, the, send him to beat the children for various offenses. He could never bring himself to do it. So, he would drag my grandmother and her sisters into the bathroom slap his own leg, tell them to put water on their faces, and run out of the bathroom, screaming with their faces in their hands. And of course, by no, time number 10, they started giggling. And it, she knew that nothing was happening. So from then on, mother got to make them go cut the switch, and that was not good. But he was, he was a very, he was, a, he was, the, he was the best cook. My grandmother said, my mother cooked okay, but my father was the real cook in the house. And so mean granny would say, I don't want his black hands on my food. She would eat the food anyway when nobody was looking. Tore it up. But she had to be her little anti-black self, so whatever. So, but he loved to play ghost tricks on her. She was very afraid of ghosts, hates. And so he would go whisper, Miss Josie, Miss Josie. <laughs> And then she would walk in the house, he'd go, <laughs> <laughs> he, he learned how to read and write from my grandmother, great-grandmother. But before he did that, one day, some chocolate showed up at the house in the mail. Remember, this is depression, so nobody has anything. And so, 
he gives every one of his seven kids some of the chocolate. There's only one problem. Um, seven kids during the Depression. Mm-hmm. Guess, that guess what the chocolate was? x lax oh. So they only had one little bathroom in our house. <laughs> so my great, <laughs> so we went screaming. Everybody's house, let us in, let us in. They didn't know what was going on until my great grandmother got a hold of the thing and said, Father, this is laxative. He said, what, what's a laxative? He called to the father and mother. He would not let white supremacy determine his family's destiny. And if the Klan came out, he would grab a, uh, um, his shotgun. And to come out, he told, told my great grandmother, don't you move, keep sewing, keep doing whatever you're doing. Told his children, don't just play, laugh. And he would sit up there, take that gun, and, and they'd be like, what you gonna do? What you gonna do, boy? He said, I'm gonna take you to hell with me if you touch my child or my woman. They never left him, they never bothered him. Great granddaddy. So my great, my mother, grandmother used to call me by his name. And she used to say, sometimes, you're like, God brought my father back to me. Mm. And if you know West African spirituality, you know that one of the greatest names you can give a child is Baba Tunde, Ya Tunde. In other words, father has returned, mother has returned. So um, he's kind of like, he's kind of like, I pay homage to him all the time. He's like my guardian on top of my mom and her and my grandfathers. So I have a lot of love for him. Um, he was a cook with the, the WPA and the Civil Conservation Corps and cooked in the Army. And when he came back from World War I, he only had one piece of clothing, one outfit. <clears throat> and so he's, he was in South Carolina, he had to walk back home. That's the only way you got anywhere back then if you were poor and black. So he's walking on the road and they arrested him in South Carolina for supposedly lynching, touching a white woman. And they were gonna lynch him. And he said, he prayed to Jesus for three days. And on the third day, they found some other brother and let him out and lynched him. Oh. Got to Alabama, he was told by God, you're gonna meet the woman of your dreams. He went to a schoolhouse, so they had a well outside, he was thirsty. Dipped, put the dipper in the well, and the reflection in the water was my great-grandmother. Wow. And that's how they met. You should write that book. Hmm. You know, <laughs> kind of did. <laughs> huh. I'm just here to set them up for you, really. <laughs> no, I, I, you know, I appreciate it because it's like we, we need to, you know this, I've seen you grow, <laughs> and I'm so happy for you and your new baby girl. We need those stories to pass on, right? Because we have a lot of storm and drawing in our lives, but we also have a lot of love. And despite all that ugliness they live through, just the fact that they could just like, you know, they loved each other the last day. He died of cancer, 46. And uh, they loved each other a lot. So much so that my grandmother and sister used to fight over who was daddy's favorite. That was serious. Or whether daddy had a cow or not in the backyard. That was, I mean, I remember. For hours, for hours. One thing they did not argue about was how good his food was. Fried perch and fried chicken, gravy, biscuits, side biscuits, hot rolls on Sunday morning. He would say grace for like five minutes straight. <laughs> he would make like 10 things for, for Sunday dinner. The middle of the day, not in the evening, middle of the day. 
And my grandma would still say they used to have the plates face down. And after you got done saying grace, you turned the plate over. Mm. I like that. I mean, even, even in my own custom in Judaism, I do that. Yeah. Why not? I don't want to honor my grandmother. I like that. Say the brachas and then mm-hmm. turn the plate open. I want, if we ever have children, my partner and I, my husband to be, we're, he was people from Alabama too. So it's interesting, like having a, a white partner who's also Southern, whose family's from Alabama, <laughs> whose family had enslaved people, and to go down south with each other and meet each other's family. Mm-hmm. And um, it's interesting. His, Che, that is the one. Yeah. Try some on the back of your hand. That's how we, that's out of the African way. But I didn't learn that from everyone from my grandma and them. Uh huh. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Pretty good, no? That's there. It's there. Yeah. I'm gonna put a pinch more salt. It's pinch salt and spice. Yep. And then we're gonna put the chicken in. <laughs> see, when we were when we were in West Africa, when people when women would see you do that, they would go nuts because they'd be like, mm-hmm. <laughs> they were like, yep. You learned this from somebody who learned somebody who was us. Mm-hmm. You are you are definitely family. You know, you want to get beat real fast in the black kitchen? Go put your spoon, your mouth all up in there. <laughs> uh, hell to the no, hell to the no, no. <laughs> My mother, God bless her, I was the most hard-headed little child ever. She would throw me out of that kitchen every damn day. Michael, <laughs> what in the hell are you doing? I thought that was my name growing up. <laughs> I thought my name was Michael, what in the hell are you doing? <laughs> one time, I, got, I didn't get whooped for this one. My mother would do the whole Jesus thing. <laughs> And it was always the light fixture. And so one time, my mother caught me opening up the light fixture on a chair, getting ready to electrocute myself. <laughs> and then of course, Michael, what in the hell are you doing? I'm looking for a God. <laughs> what do you mean? Well, you always look at the light fixture and say, Jesus! <laughs> and, uh, Michael, what the hell are you doing? So I figured if I wanted to get to God, all I had to do was get the light fixture open and therefore on the other side is God because God's looking at you and looking at me and going, Michael, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> so, yeah. How long you let this simmer in the sauce? Um, let's say, say, I don't know, 30 minutes. Okay. Yeah. So it really, you've got the crisp. Right. You let it soak in. It's smuttered, as we say in the South. Yeah. Smuttered chicken. Yeah. What else is there? And you see, it's very red. It's not. Yes, it it's is. It's not really yellow or brown. That's another thing about it. Uh-huh. It's, it's, if you, if you made this for somebody in West Africa, they're like, okay, yeah, chicken stew. What's the difference? They don't, they're like, okay, all the, all the elements, the frying of the meat before you put it in the pot, the aromatics, right? Da 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 da. Let's put our top on it. I'm going to put that on a bit. Not a phrase of my own to be said. Anyways, <laughs> you have too many gay friends, honey. <laughs> and slowly the room goes, oh. You gotta have fun in life. You know what I'm saying? Otherwise, what's 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 all this worth? I think I brought this up earlier with that comment about that person saying you don't exist. Mm-hmm. That lit a fire underneath me because I wanted to write food nonfiction that told people, yes, us different people exist. You know, I'm. So when I get to writing about my friends who are trans who are chefs, great. 
I wanted to go down the history books. We existed, we were here, we gonna be here. We've always been here. And that's just a fact, y'all can just get over it. And that wasn't, Mulvaney said get over it. Um, <laughs> so that's what I want to, to leave you all with, is this is notion, as I grow horse and horser, but uh, this notion that, you know, food is a love language. Uh -huh. you, see, you see this right here? This didn't happen in my granddaddy's time, my great-grandfather's time. I don't ever take that for granted. <laughs> my friend Ben Mims, gay boy from Mrs. White, gay boy from Mississippi. Every time we sat down in the I said, Ben, I said, your great grandfather picked cotton and my great grandfather picked cotton. They could never have imagined us sitting together eating. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or, or gay. <laughs> But I think most of all, making a living from writing about food right. and not picking a damn cotton. I don't take those things for granted. I don't take for granted the fact that in Hebrew school, my kids were of every color. And then I was, I was, for, I was grateful that despite being in a very white space, that my Asian American and Native American, Latin American and African American and Ethiopian and Indian Jewish kids looked up to me as a role model because they didn't have nobody else. And I made them feel proud to be both of color and be Jewish and be Americans. And as far as it's, the rest of it's concerned, you know what, I can't wait to go back to Africa. I can't wait to have that welcome home with other people. Can't wait to go back to Senegal. And this time we're going to the Gambia. We're going to Jufere, the um, hometown of Kuta Kente. So I'm, I'm grateful for this life. And I'm very grateful that we had the time to share together this evening. Madison has always been very good to me. I've been here I don't know how many times. I never thought I'd be back in Madison, Wisconsin. <laughs> but this is, a, this is a great food town. And um, this is, I feel like I'm with family. Yes. So thank you very much, guys. Thank you, Michael.